Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's XTALKS webinar. Today's talk is entitled Nuclear Receptors and Cancer Research, Current Trends and Applications. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your XTALKS moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 90 minutes. It will be a very engaging panelist discussion. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout this presentation by using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel, and that's found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Indigo Biosciences, Inc., who developed the content for this presentation. Indigo Biosciences, Inc. is a leading provider of nuclear receptor and in vitro toxicology solutions that accelerate scientific decision making. They supplement the world's largest portfolio of nuclear receptor kits and services and in vitro toxicology solutions with greater results, readability, reproducibility, and faster turnaround times. Their solutions plus supportive team and reliable science and platforms aim to reduce the time, cost, and risk associated with the discovery process. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to your webinar moderator for today's event. And he is Dr. Jack, Jack Vandehavel. He is a professor of molecular toxicology, pharmacology, and toxicology. He's an undergraduate program coordinator with Penn State University, chief scientific officer with Indigo Biosciences. Jack is a recognized expert in the field of nuclear receptor biology and toxicology with over 100 peer-reviewed publications. In addition to his role as CSO at Indigo, Jack is a professor at Penn State University where he is program coordinator of the undergraduate toxicology program, co-director of the Center of Excellence in Neutral Genomics, and leads an extramurally funded research program. Now, it's my pleasure to pass the mic and the controls over to Jack. So, Jack, when you're ready, you may begin. Well, thank you, Sonia. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today for our discussion of nuclear receptors and cancer research. And how we're going to address this uh, fascinating and fast-moving area shown in this outline, uh, I'm going to start out with a, a brief overview of nuclear receptors, broadly defined. Uh, what they are, how they work, and why they're important therapeutic targets. Then we'll go through some specific examples of the types of research that are being done uh, on specific nuclear receptors and their role in carcinogenesis. Then uh, after that, uh, after the brief research summaries, uh, we will uh, continue to talk about unanswered questions and future directions. So let's get started. So nuclear receptors uh, are a, a family of uh, transcription factors that uh, share a similar structure uh, with each other. And the, the sequence uh, that is most known for nuclear receptors is their DNA binding domain, which is called the C4 zinc finger. And this defines the family and there are uh, 48 uh, members of the nuclear receptor family in humans, 49 in rodents, and it's conserved uh, across the uh, different uh, phylogenic trees. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> with these uh, 48 nuclear receptors, they share a common mechanism of action. And there are really are two features that define this family of proteins. One is that they bind to specific sequences of DNA uh, and are able to regulate a specific set of, of genes. And that's defined a little more, uh, in a little more detail in this slide. So the, the basic structure of all nuclear receptors is similar, although the uh, individual amino acids may vary 
that uh, allows for specificity, not only in the, the uh, response elements, the DNA response elements that they bind to, but importantly, the types of, trend of, uh, of ligands or potential drugs that they are able to interact with. So shown on this slide is, is the basic structure going from the amino to the carboxy terminus. The C4 zinc finger is the predominant DNA binding domain. This determines the sequence of DNA that it interacts with, is all, and it also determines the type of uh, dimerization partner, whether it's a, a homodimer or a heterodimer. Uh, uh, as we move closer to the carboxy terminus, we have the ligand binding domain, which has a, a semi-conserved um, structural feature of uh, 12 alpha helices that form the binding pocket. Also important to this binding pocket is that uh, it allows specific, for specific interactions of particular chemical structures, but it also has a flexibility that uh, allows for conformational change to occur upon ligand binding. So the, the canonical uh, sequence of events that occurs to drive uh, gene regulation by nuclear receptors is shown on the right side of this slide. And uh, the, the basic uh, feature of nuclear receptors is that in the unliganded state, they're uh, inactive, they're unable to recruit uh, transcriptional uh, coactivators. Uh, they, they could be present uh, in the cytosol or they could be bound uh, to their response elements. But upon ligand binding, a transformation event occurs. And this is driven by a a conformational change, a change in structure in the protein, which allows for uh, heterodimerization or homodimerization, uh, in most cases, binding to a specific piece of DNA uh, that is found on the genes that are being regulated by this particular receptor. And then um, the liganded receptor uh, is in an optimal conformation to recruit the coactivator complex, which is a, a large um, grouping of proteins that brings the transcriptional machinery to that uh, nucleated site, which then drives target gene expression. So each receptor has different rules for what DNA, DNA it binds to, what protein-protein interactions occur, and importantly, uh, what genes are being regulated. And, and the gene regulation can be uh, upregulated or downregulated uh, based on the liganded receptor complex. Shown off to, to the corner of this slide is uh, a small subset of receptors that have a similar function but use different sequences in order to drive the same mechanism of action. One example of uh, one of these uh, so-called soluble receptors uh, is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which Dr. Purdue will talk about. This uses a different DNA binding motif, a different ligand binding motif, but the basic mechanism that you see over here is virtually identical. Conformational change, binding to specific target genes, recruitment of coactivators, and regulation of gene expression. So why are we interested in this family of proteins uh, as cancer therapeutics? Well, one of the reasons is that, that we know how important many of these nuclear receptors are in uh, biological processes. Uh, things like uh, reproductive, reproduction, uh, development, uh, physiology as it associates with uh, lipid metabolism, for example. Uh, and we also know that many of these nuclear receptors and their transcriptional uh, batteries are dysregulated in cancer. Uh, and then finally, putting the, these two together, we know that they're dysregulated, uh, that they have uh, biological processes that are important, but they're also druggable. Uh, that ligand binding domain uh, is, has evolved to respond to certain chemical structures, and we can take advantage of that by, by developing small uh, lipophilic drugs that are able to interact with these soluble receptors. So this drug ability is, is quite important uh, um, for most pharmaceutical companies, obviously. 
And in fact, about 14% of all small molecule drugs that are currently approved by the US FDA uh, primarily target nuclear receptors, but a much larger percentage of, of drugs interact with nuclear receptors perhaps as an off-target event as well. So what we know about the, the role of nuclear receptors in cancer really has to do with a lot of, of uh, basic research that's being done. And, and we're going to hear about some of this translatable research today. Uh, but we know a lot about uh, how these proteins are regulated. We, we know things about uh, agonists, antagonists of a variety of these receptors, and we can manipulate their activity. Uh, we can um, have uh, animal models that where we are able to perturb the expression, either overexpressed or knocked down in a whole animal or a, um, a tissue-specific knockout see how this contributes to physiological processes, see how that contributes to uh, the carcinogenic process as well. Uh, so we're, we're developing a lot of ways of, of trying to probe uh, how these receptors are involved in um, various aspects of, of the carcinogenic process. And what's shown on this right side is a, a very uh, uh, kind of cumbersome diagram that, that summarizes some of the work that's been done looking at the results of these studies of, of uh, regulating these uh, transcriptional networks and the effects on carcinogenesis. And as you can see, there are many of these receptors that their activity is associated with driving the carcinogenesis, carcinogenic process, many that are involved in suppression, and some where it's inconclusive, where, where it may actually have multiple roles and it's going to be difficult to tease apart um, you know, a variety of, of the, the processes that lead to uh, an oncogenic cell. Um, so, uh, you know, this is also telling us that there are ways of, of manipulating these receptors in a way that's going to help in cancer therapeutics. If you have a receptor that is pro-oncogenic, then obviously an antagonist of that pathway would be beneficial. A tumor suppressive activity, of course, you want to uh, augment that in a cancer therapeutic standpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the ways that, that we can uh, define the roles of some of these individual receptors on aspects of the carcinogenic process. And so we're going to go through uh, several examples uh, that are being done here by world experts uh, in nuclear receptors and, and each of the, the speakers that are coming up uh, are truly uh, leading the way in trying to understand how these receptors are involved in uh, physiology, therapeutics, uh, and cancer research. Our first speaker uh, today is uh, Andrew Patterson. Uh, Dr. Patterson is the Smith Professor uh, and Professor of Molecular Toxicology at Penn State. Uh, he is also the Director of the Metabolomics uh, Facility here. His joint appointments in, in Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences and the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And he's going to talk today about the Farnesoid X receptor and its role in cancer. Thanks a lot, Jack. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, you know, thanks to X Talks and Indigo for assembling, you know, this really great panel of, you know, world experts with respect to uh, many of these important receptors in health and disease. Uh, just by way of introduction, I've spent about the last 15 years focused on uh, nuclear receptors, but more importantly, using mass spec and metabolomic-based approaches to uh, identify and characterize the key ligands that uh, drive uh, their activity. So today I just want to share a little bit of some insights um, on FXR from our group and others that really uh, uh, begin to hint at its role um, in cancer. Next slide, please. So as, as Jack mentioned, uh, FXR is an important nuclear receptor. In this case, it's part of what we consider to be a, a member of the metabolic sensor, uh, a subclass, uh, structurally, it's a type 2 receptor, very similar to LXR, PPARs, PXR, and CAR. 
Um, a lot of this is uh, uh, dictated by kind of the paradigm of co-repressor displacement uh, by uh, ligand exposure. So I just want to highlight some key uh, experiments and results over uh, the history of studying FXR. So in 1995, uh, Foreman and colleagues uh, identified this responsive gene uh, after exposing um, uh, cells to uh, Farnesol metabolites. So these are important in the mevalonate pathway. And they found that this gene was induced in the liver, kidney, and gastrointestinal tract of rats. Um, and this was, you know, it, the first indication of uh, this nuclear receptor activity with, you know, by these, these types of compounds. Uh, then a, a rather a flurry of activity in the late 90s um, by three groups um, identifying that the uh, FXR was res uh, highly uh, responsive to bile acids. And then these were then identified as the endogenous ligands for FXR. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of them, namely uh, kenodeoxycholic acid being the most uh, um, efficacious and potent endogenous bile acid relative to others like deoxycholic acid and lithocholic acid. Subsequently, a variety of drugs have been developed, including abetacholic acid, which many of you are probably familiar with on the market um, as a therapy for a variety of diseases, including NASH. Um, but some of the most important uh, observations related to FXR came in, uh, in, the, in uh, the year 2000 with a knockout mouse, really you know, nailing this idea that FXR was uh, highly important for bile acid metabolism itself. Next slide, please. So over the years, FXR has been identified as a really key regulator of glucose, lipid, and bile acid metabolism. I highlight on the right uh, a slide showing how important it is, in particular with the enterohepatic circulation between the small intestine and the liver. Um, a lot of studies have focused solely on one or the other activity of FXR, whether it's in the liver and intestine, and I believe that this has led to some discrepancies in the literature related to the importance of FXR in a variety of disease processes, including cancer. Um, as I mentioned, uh, kenodeoxycholic acid is quite important for this. However, there's been a, a variety of drugs that have uh, focused on activating FXR, particularly in the liver. Uh, more recently, and just adding to the complication in the study of this receptor, uh, the gut microbiome has shown to be really important for modulating its activity, in particular through modulation of bile acid pools, um, which uh, really drive uh, the activity of FXR in both the intestine and in the liver. And in fact, a variety of drugs that we typically thought to work specifically through other mechanisms, say metformin for type 2 diabetes, has recently been shown to actually work through modulation of the microbiome and FXR activity. Next slide, please. With respect to FXR and cancer, and I think if we can frame it in the context of understanding the safety of modulating FXR, there's a little bit of um, controversial data out there, and a lot of it has been driven uh, through studies associated with, uh, the, with whole body knockouts that lack FXR. So the first uh, uh, study uh, shown at the top here uh, found that FXR in all mice develop a, a variety of liver cancers at 12 months of age. And it's important to note here that this was identified both in male and female mice. Other models, including genetic models with APC min or chemical like uh, isoxymethane, uh, also show that FXR in all mice are more prone uh, to, to, towards the development of colon cancer. However, with respect to the last slide that I showed, there are some challenges here with interpreting this data. Is this driven specifically by changes in the liver or changes in the uh, gastrin or in, in the small intestine? Other studies showing that forced overexpression of FXR actually also causes unwanted side effects, including liver toxicity and growth delay. And there is some uh, data in humans suggesting that expression of FXR, in this case in hepatocellular carcinoma, is significantly reduced compared with normal liver tissue. So there are some uh, consistent results between mice and human. However, overall, uh, there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. Next slide, please. So one of the big questions surrounding a lot of these studies is the, is the role of FXR in actually modulating or driving certain types of cancers. And I believe some of this was uh, uh, driven uh, through uh, you know, some complications with FXR in all mice. And so what's shown over on the left is a study that is comparing uh, 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 liver cancer in FXR in all mice 
compared to those mice where FXR is only deleted in hepatocytes, um, in this case driven by Cre recombinase, um, or in the intestinal epithelium. And what these slides are showing is that in the FXR in all mice, consistent with previous results, there is a dramatic increase, not only in the number of tumors per mouse, but also the number of tumors per liver. And this was only observed in FXR in all mice. This, this result was not uh, shown in the hepatocyte knockouts or the intestinal knockouts of FXR. So what is going on here? Well, it may not directly be related to FXR itself, in fact, one of the prevailing notions is that what's driving this is rather an increased inflammatory state and something that's promoting cell proliferation, basically dri driven by this toxic environment of bile acids or cholestasis um, that's actually driving cancer. And so one of the big take home message here is that a lot of the knockout data derived from FXR null mice with respect to cancer should be evaluated with caution. Next slide, please. So lastly, just to kind of summarize what I talked about, so FXR is an important bile acid receptor. It's also targeted by a variety of uh, xenobiotics. It controls a lot of important genes in bile acid synthesis, as well as in lipid and xenobiotic metabolism. So with respect to its role in cancer, one of the things I think it may be most important for is not in the treatment of cancer, but in the prevention of cancer, particularly given its role in a variety of important uh, human diseases known to increase risk for cancer, including things like obesity, fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and NASH. So with that, I'll just uh, end my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you, Andrew. Our next speaker is, is uh, Dr. Gary Perdue. Dr. Purdue is the H. Thomas and Dorothy Willits Hollowell Chair and Professor of, of Veterinary Biomedical Science. Uh, he's also the Director for the Center of Molecular Toxicology and Carcinogenesis, and he's going to talk about the aerohydrocarbon receptor and regulation of cell proliferation and differentiation. Thanks, Jack. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, I'm going to talk about the aerial hydrocarbon receptor, which is a receptor I've been working out, working on for my entire career. So, uh, first slide. So, the H receptor is the only member of a basic helix, uh, basic region helix to helix pos domain transcription factor family that is ligand activated. Um, in this family, there's also factors such as like HIP1 alpha, which is also uh, of great interest to the uh, carcinogenesis field. Uh, so the H receptor was first described to be activated by dioxin and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and that's kind of dictated for many years how this uh, field has developed. The receptor resides in the cytoplasm bound to HSP90 and XAP2, which was first described by my laboratory. This complex can bind to dioxin response elements that regulate the expression of a myriad of genes, with CYP21 being essentially the only regulated by the H receptor and so CYP1E1 makes a great uh, marker for HR activation. CYP1E1 in turn is capable of metabolizing compounds such as benzpyrene, leading to the formation of carcinogenic reactive intermediates that lead to, to cancer. For the past 25 years, the toxicologic aspects of HR function uh, were extensively studied. Only more recently has the physiologic function of this receptor been examined in detail and this has led to its recognition as a possible drug target. Uh, next slide, please. The HR has been shown to influence a wide variety of physiologic functions. However, many of these established biochemical pathways altered by HR uh, activation collectively can be considered to be important for coordinating barrier tissue function. And that's what I want to highlight today, especially in the skin and intestinal tract. In both keratinocytes and enterocytes, AHR activation enhances differentiation and slows stem cell proliferation. Both endpoints are likely uh, linked together. Perhaps the area in the AHR field that has garnered the most attention is the ability of the activated AHR to affect T cell fate, such as enhancing the formation of regulatory T cells. This has been demonstrated in the gut through attenuation of autoimmune disease in mouse models, for example, treated with dioxin. However, the downside of agonist exposure can be enhanced tumor progression uh, through multiple mechanisms that are still 
uh, being really explored. This latter observation has led to several companies developing AHR antagonists to use as cancer treatment, along with immunotherapy. Um, I've consulted for several companies interested in this concept, so this seems to be an area that there's intense interest in. Indeed, there's one recent publication by Karen McGovern from Akena uh, Oncology demonstrating that an AHR antagonist enhances anti-PD-1 therapy in rodent models. Uh, returning to barrier function, the first FDA-approved uh, uh, AHR drug that targets a disease is the AHR agonist tap taparinol, which is used to treat uh, plaque psoriasis. I suspect that this would be the first AHR uh, target drug to be approved, in part because it is actually a topical treatment, thus restricting systemic um, exposure, which I also I will caution the use of either agonist or antagonist in a long-term basis as a systemic drug. Uh, next slide, please. My laboratory has performed extensive metabolomics analyses to examine endogenous or microbiome-generated uh, tryptophan metabolites that can activate the H receptor. In this slide, note there are multiple sources of, of trip metabolites. There's the diet, there's microbial sources and actual uh, uh, endogenous or host sources. What you'll notice on this slide are multi-ring compounds that could be up to five rings that are planar and hydrophobic that are very um, high affinity lichens that are present uh, either through the diet or, or produced endogenously uh, that are present at very, very low concentrations. In contrast, some of the simpler metabolites shown here, such as endol or 3 methylendol are low affinity ligands that can be present at quite high concentrations, especially in the gut. Uh, so one thing you'll notice, for example, is that tryptophan upon UV, UV exposure can actually uh, produce FITSI. And FITSI is a very high affinity ligand, but it's also a very short-lived ligand uh, that turns over quite rapidly through CYP1 metabolism. We have published the identity of the major trip metabolites in feces that are also AHR ligands. In unpublished work, we have identified six major tryptophan metabolites in serum that are also AHR ligands, and they are present at concentrations that can lead to AHR activation. We are now examining whether, at, whether these kinds of mixtures of tryptophan metabolites present in human serum can drive AHR activation in tumor cells, and the answer is yes, they can. And it's also, um, also, it's key, it's, it's key to keep in mind that in many tumors, the H receptor is really massively upregulated. Next slide, please. Uh, my laboratory has examined the effect of dietary HR ligands on small intestinal epithelial cell phenotype. We first utilized a semi-purified diet as an AHR ligand-free, phytochemical-free diet and a 15% broccoli diet activated CYP1 expression in the small intestine. Broccoli contains endologlucobracidins, which undergo enzymatic cleavage yielding endol 3 carbonyl that undergoes acid condensation. One of the products formed is endolo 3 to be carbazol, a potent AHR agonist, which was shown on the previous slide as a five-ring structure. Broccoli-mediated AHR activation leads to a decrease in stem cell proliferation within the crypt as well as by short term, uh, as determined by short term uh, BRD labeling. In addition, broccoli diet led to a, about a two fold increase in goblet cells, which are responsible for uh, mucin production. To confirm that the HR activation mediates the effect of this broccoli diet, uh, the lower uh, uh, series of three uh, graphs, or, or graphs there show that if you add to the diet a, a uh, an AHR antagonist, CH223191, that blocks this upregulation of goblet cell number, um, further illustrating that the AHR can mediate what appears to be the uh, lineage uh, fake decisions within the intestinal tract. And this can make perfect sense when you start thinking about the fact that AHR ligands can be made by bacteria, uh, they're in the diet, and it's a way in which we respond to the presence of these compounds and try to improve barrier function, in this case, uh, enhancing uh, mucin production to ward off whatever the exposure might be. A final point about the use of a mouse model is that we've determined that the human receptor is activated to a greater extent by a number of trip metabolites compared to the, to the mouse receptor. 
So this highlights a problem in comparing um, across species, especially going from mouse to human. Next slide, please. Uh, in a collaboration with Dr. Ellen van den Volgaard in the in Netherlands, we've been utilizing a series of endosol-based derivatives. We have about 40 compounds that have been made um, or synthesized by Dr. Chantou Amin's lab um, as AHR agonists, and they're labeled as SGA compounds with different numbers. They vary in their AHR activation potential, going from antagonism to full act, uh, agonist activity. In a 3D human keratinocyte uh, air interface model, the ability of AHR agonists, such as TCD, used as the positive control, if you will, and various SGA compounds were tested, and the level of filaggrin expression in stratum corneum development were examined. Note in this slide that SGA 3D88 and SGA 360F formed the thickest stratum corneum labor, layer, which is actually, uh, in, as far as if you look at SGA 38, is better than TCDD. While SGA360 is an AHR antagonist and attenuates the development of the stratum corneum. Note the presence of FCIP21 in the basal layer, which is consistent with the concept that the AHR mediates differentiation. These, uh, these results underscore the key role the AHR plays in the formation of a protective outer layer of the skin. And indeed, probably this is the likely mechanism of Teparanoff um, efficacy um, in psoriasis. In conclusion, the H receptor is a sensor of the presence of microorganisms, UV exposure, or dietary cues that regulate barrier tissue homeostasis, and, and indeed AHR activity during tumor genesis. With the approval of the first drug that targets the AHR, should stimulate the use of the AHR as a target for other diseases. Finally, uh, William um, Borgart's lab in France has published a preprint of the cryo-EM structure of the AHR HSP90 XAB2 complex at 2.85 angstrom resolution, which should allow uh, accurate docking models to be generated for drug design. So I think we might be right at the cr a cusp of, of really uh, fine-tuning the type of structures that would most efficaciously activate the receptor and not have all target effects. So, uh, so I think we're right at the dawn of, of developing drugs that will be effective in, in cancer treatment. Thank you. Great, thank you, Gary. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeff Peters. Dr. Peters is a distinguished professor of molecular toxicology and carcinogenesis at Penn State, and he's a deputy director of the Penn State Cancer Institute. And uh, Jeff is going to talk about uh, PPAR, beta, delta, and colon cancer. Thank you for the introduction, Jack, and thank you for this uh, really excellent venue for us to present. Uh, this has been a very exciting meeting so far. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, peroxidome proliferator activated receptor beta, PPR beta, and colon cancer. And I hope I can show you how things have changed in this field over the past 20 years. Now, like Gary uh, before me, I've been studying PPR beta. It's been the focus of my career as well. Um, and for clarity, I, I use the term PPR beta, um, but others, including NCBI, uh, refer to it as PPR delta. But since I've been uh, studying this pro gene product for more than 25 years, it's kind of hard to stop saying PPR beta. So for this talk, I'm going to use PPR beta, uh, but it's the same. So many people have uh, been studying PPRs uh, during the 1990s, and there were some recognized roles determined for PPR alpha and PPR gamma uh, that were determined during these latter stages of this time frame, And that was due in large part to technologies that were being developed, including transgenic mice, uh, selective PPR agonists, and omics-based technologies that were emerging. Um, by contrast, during that same time frame, the role of PPR beta were, was a little bit less well defined. So, again, the next slide, Jack. So, one of the first hypothetical roles for PPR beta was described in 1999, and it's summarized by the figure from this work on the left panel. The results from this study suggested that a mutant APC gene, uh, it's a relatively common mutation in colon cancer patients causes increased expression of PPR beta in colon tumors compared to normal tissue. 
At this time, it was hypothesized that beta-catenin pathway directly mediated this change. When one copy of the APC gene is mutant, uh, the beta-catenin pathway becomes activated, and this complex can then increase expression of target genes, such as uh, cyclin D1. Now, this work from this paper suggested that beta-catenin also directly increased expression of PPR beta and potentially promoted colon cancer. The results from the study also suggested that inhibition of COX-2 might promote colon cancer by directly activating this receptor. And at that time, it was an attractive hypothesis that the, it potentially explained how NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, inhibited colon cancer by inhibiting COX-2. So subsequent studies by our laboratory group and others have resulted in conflicting results over time. So for example, shortly after the initial hypothesis that PPR beta promotes colon cancer, other groups also reported that higher expression of PPR beta was associated with colon cancer progression and that activating PPR beta enhances colon cancer in mouse and human models. Additionally, some of these studies also showed that the latter effect required PPR beta as the increased intestinal tumor genesis observed were not noted in PPR beta null mice. By contrast, other groups, including ours, reported that low or no expression of PPR beta promotes colon cancer and that activating PPR beta prevents colon cancer in mouse and human models. Some of these studies also show that the preventive effects required PPR beta as the changes in colon tumor genesis were not found in PPR beta null mice. Next slide, Jack. So one approach that our lab has taken to address these disparities is to critically examine the role of PPR beta increasing and decreasing expression um, in different models. And to do this, we started by looking at tissue expression patterns of PPR beta and we found that expression of this protein is very high in the intestine. And we say this with very high confidence because of the way we quantified PPR beta in this work using methods were developed by Dr. Perdue's lab. And that PPR beta is high in relative expression in the colon has been also noted by many others in other papers and other groups. So when we examine relative expression of PPR beta in colon tumors from APC min mice, like you can see here on the left panel, we found that expression of cyclin D1 is markedly higher compared to normal tissue. By contrast, expression of PPR beta is about 50% lower in colon tumors compared to normal tissues. Uh, we and others have reported this in both mouse and in human models, co colon tumor models. So most studies to date that have examined expression of PPR beta in colon note relatively high constitutive expression in this tissue in both mouse and human models. And moreover, most studies to date that have examined expression of PPR beta also note that relative lower levels are found in colon tumor models compared to normal tumors. Next slide, please. So we've used another approach to get at this issue of relative expression of PPR beta in cancer cells using a retroviral model that allows for easy sorting of cells and that allows us to express a lot of this protein in these models. The vector design that we use is shown in the upper left figure that green part there. And there, there's no need to really look at the data that's on the right panels in detail. I'm going to summarize them very quickly. We used that vector to markedly increase the expression of PPR beta in the two different breast cancer cell lines, MDA cells and the M MCF7s. And we compared what we saw in these cells to controls. And you can see the higher expression of PPR beta in both cell lines on the top western blot. And you can see that activating PPR beta target gene, it, it, I should say, you can see that activating PPR beta with an agonist in normal cells dose-dependently increased expression of a known PPR beta target gene. And this effect was greatly enhanced in the cells that had much higher expression of PPR beta. So these effects are shown in the middle panels on the left side of this, or on the left and right side of this figure here. And the results from the tumor studies are, are most convincing here. So moving from left to right on the bottom panels, you can see that when you activate PPR beta in either cell line, that the tumors derived from these cells are smaller than controls. When you increase the, the expression of PPR beta alone, 
you also see that these tumors are smaller. And finally, when you increase expression of the protein and activate it at the same time, the tumors are even smaller than compared to controls. And these examples are shown from references in the left that are from breast cancer cell lines, testicular cancer cell lines, and neuroblastoma cell lines. But we've seen these facts in other cell types, including liver, colon, and uh, lung cancer cell lines, minimally. Next slide, please. And so our lab and others, we still think that PPR beta can be targeted to help people. In 2010, the National Center for Biotechnology and CBI the definition included a phrase that indicated expression of PPR beta is elevated in colorectal cancer cells and repressed by APC. However, this has been changed in 2017, and you'll see what it says on the right. NCBI now indicates that expression of PPR beta is variable, but typically lower in tumors. So where does this leave us today? Currently, it is no longer accepted by experts in the field that mutant APC increases expression of PPR beta in colon tumors, as once hypothesized. The more rigorous studies to date show that relative expression of PPR beta is actually lower, but still functional in colon tumors. This is explained in greater detail in the review that is cited in the middle of this slide. Despite the relative, this relative clarity that I've described today, there are still many papers on PPR beta that don't capture the state of the field today. Our research group is working towards building consensus around the idea that PPR beta is protective in cancers. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, our last speaker today is, is Dr. Sandeep Prabhu, who's the head of the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences, professor of immunology and molecular toxicology. And he's gonna talk about activation of PPAR gamma and leukemia therapy. Thanks, Jack, uh, for the introduction. And thanks to Xtox and Indigo Biosciences for the opportunity to talk about our work. Today, I'm going to tell you about the role of uh, PPR gamma uh, in myeloid leukemia therapy with a focus on targeting leukemia stem cells. Next slide, please. So unlike other cancers, uh, the stem cell basis of the disease is much well defined in hematologic malignancies, particularly myeloid leukemias. Uh, where normal hematopoietic stem cells or HSCs over a period of time accumulate certain mutations and due to genetic uh, recombination events such as those uh, that shown here 922 translocation leads to the formation of these uh, stem cells that have the leukemia ability or we call them leukemia stem cells now these cells can differentiate into bulk tumor cells that are usually targeted by radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, however, the leukemia stem cells are relatively resistance, resistant. So targeting these uh, cells, the leukemia stem cells, actually could help in bringing about clinical remission. Next slide, please. So many years ago, a research paper by the uh, Jordan Laboratory suggested uh, the potential of certain endogenous ligands, um, such as those shown here, uh, particularly hydroxynoninol, prostaglandin J2, could function as agents to target these leukemia stem cells. And one of them, particularly the prostaglandin J2, uh, which uh, we had actually worked on in the past, was seen to be produced when we, those cells with uh, uh, non-toxic levels, high levels of uh, selenium uh, in the diet. So selenium is a trace element uh, and uh, treatment of cells with uh, selenium increases selenoproteins and selenocompounds compounds that leads to uh, skewing of the arachidonic acid metabolism pathway leading to the formation of these uh, cyclopentanone prostaglandins such as those shown on the right panel uh, including delta-12 prostaglandin J2 and the 15-deoxy prostaglandin J2. These molecules uh, have been shown to actually activate uh, PPR gamma by uh, Ron Evans's laboratory and Steve Cleaver's laboratory in the past. 
And uh, they act as uh, ligands for this PPR gamma, in addition to inhibiting NF kappa B, activating AP1, and also activating, activating NR2 through KEEP1 modification. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this slide actually shows the method we used to generate uh, CML in the laboratory, uh, where we used the normal hematopoietic stem cells that are harvested from, a, uh, from the bone marrow, and then uh, they are transduced with a virus that expresses the human uh, fusion oncoprotein BCR ABO that is seen in mostly uh, Philadelphia positive or pH positive patients of CML and other uh, leukemias. So when these bulk cells or these um, cells are trans, uh, transplanted into mice, they lead to the formation of the uh, disease. Now these uh, cells, can be isolated from the mice and be serially transplanted, further uh, you know, um, uh, confirming the stem cell basis of the disease. So when we transplanted these mice into, uh, transplanted these cells into mice that were maintained on specific diets, uh, either deficient in selenium or adequate in selenium, or just you know, had four times more of uh, selenium in the diet as supplemented diet, what we found was the selenium supplemented uh, diet actually uh, completely led to the remission of the disease while the deficient and the adequate um, uh, mice or the mice that were on these diets actually uh, succumbed to the disease. As you can see from the white cell counts on the right-hand side and also the uh, stem cell numbers in the bone marrow. Next slide, please. So based on our uh, pre pre previous work in macrophages, uh, where we examined the PPR gamma uh, activation by selenium supplementation, and that showed PPR gamma was activated by uh, uh, these uh, cyclopentenone prostaglandin ligands, we also examined if uh, PPR gamma was activated upon selenium treatment of uh, leukemia stem cells. And the data shown here uh, suggests that that is indeed the case, which led to the hypothesis. Uh, Jack, the next uh, slide, please. So which led to the hypothesis that along with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are typically used to treat uh, leukemias, uh, such as imatinib shown here, one could use some of these ligands or even just use PPR gamma uh, synthetic agonists, such as pioglitazone shown here, to treat uh, leukemia. However, given that synthetic ligands have uh, you know, not been used due to other reasons, we believe that selenium dependent ligands uh, generated through the diet might actually uh, provide us uh, a way forward to treat uh, leukemias. Next slide, please. So uh, we, what we did first was to see if bioglitazone uh, could actually treat CML sick mice uh, that were on uh, either selenium adequate or selenium deficient diet. The data shown here is uh, with selenium adequate mice that were treated with pioglitazone or not, just the vehicle controls. And what you see here is that pioglitazone was effective as a PPR gamma ligand, as well as it reduced the leukemic load in peripheral blood and decrease the leukemia stem cell count, both in the spleen as well as in the bone marrow uh, that are shown in panels uh, C as well as in panels E. Next slide, please. We then uh, did a, a, a reverse experiment where we used a PPR gamma antagonist to see if it could inhibit the effect of selenium in the selenium supplemented mice that were in uh, remission, right? Uh, or that caused uh, remission. So when the uh, cells, the leukemia cells were transplanted into mice, and then we started uh, treating those mice with GW9662, a PPR gamma antagonist, we saw that the, the use of uh, PPR gamma antagonist was able to reverse the disease as seen in the form of leukocytosis. Um, in panel B, we uh, saw a, uh, a increase in splenomegaly, and then we also saw an increased leukemia stem cell load 
in the spleen and bone marrow, suggesting that indeed PPR gamma was activated in, uh, in, the, in these mice upon treatment with uh, selenium and the dye. Next, uh, next slide, please. So interestingly, uh, antagonism of PPR gamma also led us uh, to uh, this interesting result where the, the expression of many pro-survival genes, most of them that are part of the uh, polycomb gene family, as well as a master regulator of uh, leukemia stem cell quiescence called cited 2 was also increased upon treatment with the antagonist. In addition to this, we also saw that there was an increase in the expression of, a, um, of an enzyme called 15 prostaglandin dehydrogenase. This enzyme actually oxidizes various uh, prostaglandins, including prostaglandin J2, to inactivate them. Next slide, please. So uh, the increase in prostaglandin uh, dehydrogenase that was seen uh, in, in our uh, PPR gamma antagonist treated mice also uh, corroborated with the results showing that indeed the uh, prostaglandin J2 that was produced in those mice were actually was actually oxidized. And these uh, oxidized products were no longer activators of PPR gamma suggesting that PPR gamma anti antagonism actually increases the oxidation and inactivation of this uh, prostaglandin J2 uh, metabolites. Next slide, please. So in summary, this, these data actually suggest that PPR gamma activation by endogenous as well as exogenous ligands uh, or agents can actually help specifically target the cancer stem cells, in this case, it is the leukemia stem cells, to effectively bring about remission. We're now trying to understand some additional mechanisms as, how, as to how these cyclopentenone prostaglandins act through activating PPR gamma to affect the uh, uh, leukemia stem cell uh, self-renewal and maintenance as well as additional pathways. So thanks, Jack. For the opportunity again. Well, thank you, Sandeep, and and thank uh, thank you all the speakers uh, for wonderful talks. And uh, remember uh, to those of you in the audience that if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, put them into the chat box, and we'll get to those after um, my future perspectives discussion. So. Uh, obviously, from the research that's been shown and, and from other research that, that's out there, we have been making major strides to understanding uh, how nuclear receptors work, how they uh, impact biology, how they uh, impact oncology. And a lot of this has to do with, with the burgeoning omics technologies that are out there, the transcriptomics, metabolomics, et cetera. And so we can understand more about what happens uh, when you activate or, or repress a nuclear receptor, how all of these uh, receptors might be interacting with each other, how their um, uh, genetic factors might be uh, um, interacting functionally with each other. And of course, we know that uh, targeting nuclear receptors has uh, shown great utility, in particular when you uh, think about uh, targeting the estrogen receptor alpha or the androgen receptor. And these are already uh, very um, well utilized targets for cancer treatment, uh, looking for uh, uh, antagonists in particular of these major hormone signaling pathways uh, have been very important in uh, breast cancer uh, and uh, prostate cancer. And of course, uh, some of the uh, most groundbreaking work that has been done trying to really show the mechanism by which nuclear receptors are contributing to cancer are coming from animal models. Um, so where do we go from here? What are the, the opportunities? Well, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that there are 48 nuclear receptors uh, that are out there that we have some understanding of uh, how they work, what they're regulated. Uh, but there are a handful of drugs that are orphan receptors that we don't know what their biological niche is, and so we don't know what their clinical utility 
uh, might be. Uh, also, as I mentioned, a lot of the um, important models for understanding the carcinogenic process comes from animal studies. Uh, we need, need to know whether uh, those animal studies are pertinent to the human disease, so we have to be able to, to predict this uh, species extrapolation. Um, the, the idea that um, maybe we don't want uh, ultra-specific drugs, that we want to uh, approach this more from a, a polypharmacology where we have multiple targets that are being addressed by one drug, as well as a, a process called select, selective receptor modulation, or SERMs, where we can get tissue-specific effects. Uh, this is an area that is, is gaining some notoriety. And what we're trying to do is, is try to find drug modalities that have a, a better safety and efficacy profile. And then finally, trying to address uh, how we can use all this mechanistic information uh, in precision medicine. So understanding how sequence variations, mutations, polymorphisms, how they can be exploited and how we can understand them better. So I'm going to go through some of the, the ways that we look at trying to fill in these blanks and, and try to address these opportunities. And uh, Indigo Biosciences uh, utilizes a, a very simple but powerful system in order to look at therapeutics and try to understand their activity. And these are our cell-based reporter assays. And so these are, are just simple systems where we are, are modifying the cell so that we can, uh, we can uh, depict transcription factor activity uh, driving an artificial gene. And so we use uh, a luciferase uh, as a very easy uh, and sensitive quantifiable gene uh, to incorporate into our cells. And really, we have two different uh, flavors of these cell-based reporter assays. Uh, the first one on your left is, is the classic uh, cis trans assay, uh, where we're expressing a specific nuclear receptor. We have a reporter gene that has the, the response element for that particular receptor. We put both of these in a cell, add a ligand, it's able to regulate the proper conformational change, recruit the coactivators, and we get measurable luciferase activity. Another way to, to uh, generate a cell-based assay uh, is with a cis-trans assay, where we are taking advantage of the um, uh, modular structure of nuclear receptors, where we can take one domain out of the out of the receptor and add it to a heterologous uh, domain. In this case, uh, adding the ligand binding domain for the nuclear receptor with the DNA binding domain of a yeast transcription factor GAL4. So this is an artificial gene. The cell has never seen it before, and this can give a lot of specificity uh, to just looking at the ligand dependent activation. In this case, you add a ligand, conformational change, able to uh, bring uh, transcription machinery to this complex, but now we're regulating a GAL4 response element and the uh, receptor, and I'm, I'm sorry, the, the reporter gene. So we built a lot of uh, different, um, both the, the classic and the cis-trans assays, uh, looking at endogenous or full-length um, estrogen receptor, androgen receptor, and with the closely related uh, members, like what we talked about today with the PPAR alpha and gamma, since they both have virtually identical DNA binding domains, really the only way to get at specificity would be to use this cis-trans assay, where we are isolating uh, each ligand binding domain. And there are a variety of different receptors that we have pre-existing assays for. This would be a great way of addressing orphan receptors and start screening for those receptors where we don't understand what the endogenous uh, ligands are or what the uh, potential um, uh, xenobiotic regulators are. And an important uh, uh, utilization of these tools, these in vitro tools, are to incorporate in polymorphic forms of the nuclear receptors or polymorphic or mutant forms of the DNA binding domain. Uh, so in this way, we can start to address precision medicine 
Uh, and I'll get to uh, one way that we've used this uh, in my last slide. All right, so one of the aspects of, of um, nuclear receptor biology is that uh, these are not really the classic switch where you either have them on or off. Uh, there are different uh, gradations of, of activity, and really the, the type of ligand that you have is dependent on the structural change that occurs when that ligand binds to the nuclear receptor. So it's shown on the left over here is a, the ligand binding domain, just showing uh, a, a cartoon of what the helical structures, the alpha helices look like in that binding pocket. Uh, in the unliganded uh, receptor complex, the, the domain that interacts with the coactivators is buried within that ligand binding domain, and it is not accessible to the transcriptional machinery. So this would be considered an, an off receptor. Now, if we add uh, a full agonist, uh, like in this case, estradiol with the estrogen receptor, we get a conformational change. We get the optimal configuration of helix 12, which allows for maximal recruitment of the coactivator complex, and you get maximal activity. If you look at a pure antagonist, again, you get binding to the ligand binding domain, but now you've buried the helix 12 in such a way where you do not get any coactivator recruitment. And so this is uh, shut off. And also if the receptor is liganded with an antagonist, it will not be able to be occupied by the agonist in order to lead to that permissive shape. Now, what I want to draw your attention to here is what happens if you get to a structure that is halfway in between an, a pure agonist and a pure antagonist. In this case, you get binding, but the conformational change is such that that helix 12 is not uh, uh, fully available to the coactivator complex, and uh, but you still do get some of that complex that, that's present. So if you look at the, at the dose response curves uh, on this right-hand panel, you can see a full agonist, optimal recruitment, optimal, optimal uh, agonism. The partial agonist will lead to a less than optimal response, even when you're getting to maximal occupancy. And then you have a full antagonist, which does not allow for coactivator uh, to be, be recruited. I wanted to, to show another structure down here, which is uh, a term that you may not have heard before. And this is an inverse agonist. So this is uh, starting with the receptor that is already in a permissive structure. But now when a ligand binds, it causes a conformational change, which blocks the coactivator complex. So it recruits the co-repressor. So it's not competing for an agonist, for an agonist, it is decreasing that activity. I put this slide up here because virtually every receptor has the potential for having full agonists, partial agonists, antagonists of various uh, gradations, as well as inverse agonists. And several receptors do show uh, all of these different responses. It just depends on which ligand you're looking at. I also want to bring up the, the, this idea of a selective receptor modulator, and that's for these partial agonists that have a suboptimal coactivator recruitment uh, structure. Uh, these tend to cause uh, tissue-specific effects. Uh, so it depends on what, what are the coactivators that are present in, in that cell. So these partial agonists, you can design these in order to uh, become uh, uh, tissue specific. Uh, one of the, the issues that is always important in drug discovery is how do you apply your animal models to humans? Um, and this is something that's easily done with the reporter assays that I mentioned previously. And this is just showing a, a simple example with the uh, nuclear receptor PXR. And so the, the traditional reporter assay, you can uh, show a variety of full agonists and partial agonists for the human receptor. 
but you can also take the ligand binding domain uh, for different species and ask the question, uh, well, this is a ligand for the human PXR. Does it have the same affinity and uh, efficacy for other ligand binding domains? And so you can swap out the, the human receptor for uh, different sequences uh, for monkey, dog, and rat. And as you can see on this bottom figure, that there is a lot of, of species differences that, that occur with PXR. And actually, we see this with, with a, quite a few other receptors as well, including uh, cons constitutive andestin receptor, uh, the PPARs, as well as the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. I did want to bring up one uh, other important species specific uh, issue, and that's there are certain drug targets that lead to tumors that are now believed to be rodent specific. Uh, for example, the activation of PPAR alpha has been associated with increased liver tumors in uh, rats and mice. Uh, this is now believed to be uh, rodent specific, and we don't expect these uh, same types of, of, uh, of toxicities to occur uh, in humans. And finally, I want to uh, address how we can use these tools uh, to look at polymorphisms and mutations. Uh, so uh, in this case, what, what, we, what we're looking at are known mutations in the uh, estrogen receptor alpha and androgen receptor that have been associated with decreased responsiveness to cancer chemotherapy. And so all of these different mutations uh, that are shown in the estrogen receptor are affecting uh, estrogen receptor activity. They are modulating uh, the ability of us to target these particular tumors that are carrying these mutations. Similarly, uh, mutations in the uh, androgen receptor have been associated with poor outcomes in cancer chemotherapy. And I highlight one mutation here, which is a, the L701H mutant form of the androgen receptor. And uh, this is a, an interesting um, mutation in that it changes the ligand specificity of the androgen receptor. And that's shown at the bottom here, the wild type androgen receptor, when we look at this in our cell-based assays. Uh, very uh, uh, testosterone, the natural hormone, very potent activator, regulates uh, androgen responsive genes. When you incorporate this single site mutation, you no longer get activation with testosterone, but now you've switched this into a cortisol sensing receptor. And what's important here is, is you've changed the ligand specificity, but this is still driving androgen receptor genes. And so it's still participating in the ligand dependent activation. So by using these tools, we can start to look at at different mutations. Uh, we've also looked at different uh, polymorphisms, uh, particularly in the ligand binding domain of receptors like PPAR alpha, and looked at, at how uh, we get differences in the affinity and efficacy of dietary fatty acids, for example, which again would have a, an impact on uh, therapeutic potential for certain populations of individuals. Okay, again, I'd, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, and uh, I would like to um, request that any uh, questions be put into the chat group, and I'll try to moderate and try to keep the uh, conversation going. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Sonia. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Jack. I just want to first say thank you very much to Jack, Andrew, Gary, Jeffrey, and Sandeep for that very insightful presentation and discussion. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And with that, we're going to put on our webcams. We'll invite it. Oh, there is Jack. He's put on his. And I just want to remind the audience, if you can please send in your questions by using that questions window that's located on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll try to attend to your questions with the time that we have together. Now, I did receive a bunch of questions that I forward those to Jack, because Jack is going to moderate the Q&A. So, Jack, when you're ready, you may go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you, Sonia. And I think I'll, I'll uh, try to group these uh, by uh, the, the speaker. Uh, so the first question uh, is going to uh, Dr. Patterson. And uh, 
the question is, uh, are there species differences in FXR activation? Yeah, yeah. so that, I mean, it's, a, it's an important question and I, the, the answer is yes. Uh, this is driven for a number of different reasons, one of which between mouse and human, bile acid uh, composition is quite different. Uh, this was recently uh, demonstrated by Frank Gonzalez's group showing that one of the key differences is the presence of uh, CYPC70 um, in mouse versus human, which is responsible for the production of muricolic acids. So in, in, with respect to what is driving those different changes, that's one of the big things between mouse and human. It also complicates things a little bit too. Thank you. Um, uh, next question is for, for Dr. Perdue. Uh, are we ready to adopt tryptophan metabolites as the endogenous ligand for AHR? Yes, although I think there's going to be many endogenous uh, tryptophan metabolites, and the question is really going to be which ones are bacterial, which ones are produced by the host, and trying to figure out how these are actually regulated and whether they're, they're just spontaneous products, which like Fitzy, for example, has been detected in urine, yet it seems to be a chemical reaction that leads to it. So I think which ones are, are particularly important uh, for maintaining basal activity as opposed to which ones are perhaps uh, appear during oxidative stress is, is going to be some of the big questions. But yes, I think we are ready to at, at least adapt the concept that, that these tryptophan metabolites are indeed endogenous ligands. Keeping in mind that the ones that are microbial, you have to sort of consider as pseudo-endogenous. Um, to, to follow up on, on uh, that question, Dr. Perdue, uh, so you mentioned uh, that long-term agonist or antagonist treatment with these ligands is a concern. Could you clarify what you mean by that? Well, if you think about autoimmune disease versus cancer uh, from a T-cell standpoint, now, regulatory T cells uh, are, are a good thing to have in an autoimmune disease. It's a bad thing to have in cancer. So if you push either with an agonist or antagonist one direction or the other, uh, one's going one's to be a good outcome, one's going to be a bad outcome. It depends on what disease we're looking at. And so I suppose if you have cancer, you're less worried about autoimmune disease. So as, as a treatment for cancer, um, you don't want to die. So uh, I, this may not be an issue, but but if you're you have an autoimmune disease, you know, is it a good target for autoimmune disease when you have this downside of perhaps promoting cancer? Okay. It's actually kind of a similar question that goes to uh, to Dr. Peters. Uh, the uh, your data is showing that that uh, PPAR uh, beta. Uh, Overexpression in some studies is considered negative. Other studies, it's considered positive. Where are you currently standing as far as whether overexpression of, of uh, PPAR in cancer means anything? Yeah, I, well, I, I pretty clear with my presentation that uh, we don't think that AT, we don't, we we don't think we cannot repeat that APC increases PPR beta expression, and I know other labs have failed to that as well. But I think that. Um, the expression is probably it, it just I think fundamentally from a PPR beta perspective that settling the issue of whether expression is changed or not during can't car during the carcinogenesis process is an important issue and I think that's the the issue that I was trying to address and that is that you know it's it was suggested 20 years ago that it was increasing but with the omics data that's out there and you can look at very large databases you can look at APC mutations lots of other downstream effector molecules, and you don't see the changes you would expect to see in PPR beta that you would be based on that, that mechanism. So that's why I say I don't think people were accepting that anymore because the data don't support it. And so that's, we, we're not headed in that direction. Our models, so the, the gain of function models that we're using suggest the opposite, that, that we're getting repression. And so that's the area, that's the, that's the direction we're headed. Okay. Um. And another question for, for you, Jeff. Uh, um, are there other uh, therapies that are currently 
being targeted with uh, p power beta or delta agonists or antagonists? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jack, um, because there is, a, we've published data on that uh, in collaboration with Frank's group down at NIH and others as well, that when you repress, or when you just knock out the gene, you get many genes going up and down. So it, it would suggest that um, in cells that express a lot of PPR beta, just constitutively, um, epithelial cells, for example. So that would suggest the presence of endogenous ligands and much to what you were talking about at the end of your presentation about the different, and, the, and I know Gary and Andrew think this too, that there's all these, and endogenously there's many molecules that are probably interacting with the receptors and that that's probably what's dictating their activities. And so I, I think that's gonna be a culmination of what the ligands are coupled with expression patterns, which those two things have to be kind of reconciled together collectively before we're gonna get an understanding of where we're at. That's why we're so focused on expression more so than ligand effects kind of. We're going, we go that road, but it, we always go back to the fundamental of expression. Okay, that thank you. Um, Dr. Prabhu, uh, so your your uh, examination of selenium and PPAR gamma, are these effects additive or synergistic between selenium and the PPAR gamma ligands? Short answer is uh, they are uh, syn synergistic, I would say. Uh, the reason I say that is because uh, PPR gamma activators uh, do increase endogenous cyclopentanones. And those endogenous cyclopentanones then come, can come back and act in a autocline or paracline fashion. Uh, but uh, just using selenium on its own, you, based on our studies, of course, this is preclinical data, we can see that you don't need PPR gamma uh, synthetic agonists. So uh, the short answer is uh, synergistic. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question uh, here for Dr. Purdue. The addition of AHR ligands induces keratinocyte differentiation. How can one confirm that it is improving barrier function and not inducing hyperplasia? Well, so actually it's gonna get down, of course, to the dose uh, that, you're, that you're utilizing in, in which way you wanna view this. But, but the, uh, uh, I think the bottom line is, is that they've done uh, various different barrier uh, testing, like uh, tape stripping and so forth, things like that on humans to actually show that indeed it appears to improve barrier uh, function in actual human clinical trials. Okay, thank you. And Sandeep, uh, what looks like might be the, the last question, um, does this mechanism that, that you've shown for CML, uh, does, do you, think that this is going to be a, a mechanism that you'll see in other types of cancer as well? Yeah, that's a good question, Jack. Um, yeah, uh, we have uh, a manuscript currently under review showing that indeed this same, me this mechanism actually also can work in acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, and uh, some preliminary data uh, also with uh, colon cancer says, uh, shows us that similar mechanisms to work there. Uh, so at least in AML, uh, we, we can, I can confidently say, yes, it, it does. That's great. Well, it looks like we do not have any more uh, questions from the audience. So again, I'd like to thank the, the speakers and I'll, I'll turn it over to Sonia. Okay, well, thank you very much for those answers. We have reached the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at Indigo Biosciences, Inc. will follow up with you after this presentation. And if you have any further questions, please direct them to the email address that's appearing on your screen. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. Your participation is strongly appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, give me a few seconds. I'm going to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event with that link, and you can also share this link with your colleagues once they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Jack, Andrew, Gary, Jeffrey, and Sandeep for that very engaging presentation and for answering all your questions. So thank you very much, gentlemen.
And there's their smiles. There they go. All right. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Bye, everyone.